Now, last week, we started this series that we call the ABCs and Ds of the family, of the family. Uh, a while ago, I heard a story about a, 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 a mother who was already in her late years of life, and she was a little bit hard of hearing, but she had three sons who were already professionals and were successful in their, in, in their life. So they got together and they, and they said, you know what, uh, mother's birthday is coming up, so we have to come up and, and give her a gift. And uh, these three brothers, you know, brothers are competitive with each other. And they said, well, let's come up with see who can give her the best gift for her birthday. So one of them, Peter, gave mom a house, a mansion, a beautiful house. David, the second one, gave mom a car, but not just a car. It was a limousine with chauffeur and everything. But the third one, John, he gave mom a parrot. But this parrot was a special. See, mom couldn't hear very well, and she couldn't see very, very well anymore. So this parrot had the ability to recite text from the Bible. You see, if you would say Genesis 1-1, the parrot would say, in the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. So mom didn't have to read anymore because the parrot was right there. So the birthday came and they all three, all three of the sons gave their birthday gift to their mother. And after a few days, they each got letters from mom. The first letter said, Peter, thank you so much for the house. But the house was way too big. All I need is one room. And cleaning the house is so tedious and hard. But thank you. The second letter, David. The car is nice. But see, I don't leave the house much anymore. And the chauffeur, the driver, he's kind of rude. The third letter went out, John, you truly know your mom's desires. The chicken was great. <laughs> you know, oftentimes we try to do things in our homes. We try to, to do things to improve our family, but we don't do it the right way. And oftentimes it happens because we're really not doing what we should be doing. We try to fix something that we don't know is broken, or if something that is broken, we don't know how to fix it. The second law of thermodynamics says, and now I'm going into physics, that anything left to itself, it's going to get worse. Last week, we, we, we visited the family of Joseph, and we discovered that Joseph's family was not perfect, that his brothers were not perfect, that his parents were not perfect, that Joseph was not perfect. Left by itself, it would just have been a history of suffering and pain and, and lies, but we knew that something was done to change the whole story of the family of Joseph. But that happened then. Today, things are a little different. In fact, they're a little worse. I'm going to share with you some statistics about families today. 30% of married people experience some kind of violence. 30%. Now, don't look around. Just 30%. Also, 200,000 children, and this is not funny, 200,000 children are abused physically in the United States every year. The greatest assassin of children younger than five years is their parents. 70% of murders are caused by a family member. 
the room in the house where more crimes are committed is the kitchen. That is why I never go in the kitchen. <laughs> but you can see, you can see that, that we have a problem. We have a problem. And the numbers don't lie because we know somebody who's been abused. We know a family that has suffered abused. We know that this is real. This is a real issue. Carl Zimmerman, he is a, a student, a, a, a scholar of culture and family. And he wrote a book about the fall of civilizations and the falls of uh, the family in today's world. And he found some interesting principles comparing the cultures that have fallen through history and, and the family today. And this is what he came up with. Marriage ceases to be sacred. Now, remember, this is a comparison between the cultures that fell and the family today. These are the principles, the reasons why these civilizations fell. So this is some of the th these are some of the things that he found. First, marriage ceases to be sacred and marriage is more frequently replaced by divorce. Another reason that, that, that he found why civilizations are falling is that there is a loss for the marriage ceremony. In fact, cohabitation becomes a norm. And probably you are looking at our culture today. Another, another principle that he found is that there is an increment of display of lack of respect in public venues towards parents and authority. Another principle is that acceleration of delinquency and juvenile promiscuity. promiscuity. Another principle is that, that he found is that there is a rejection of people in traditional marriage. And finally, this is what he found. There is an increased desire and acceptance of adultery. According to Zimmerman, these are the reasons why civilizations in the past, like the Roman Empire, fell. So you know now that we are in trouble. Any system that is left to itself progressively will get worse. I'd like to share with you this morning that the first element that we need to acquire as part of our family system today to counteract the course of civilization and its effects is that we need to practice affection. Affection. Affection comes in two different attitudes. And if you're taking notes, this is the time when you take your notes out. Because the first attitude that affection appears is an attitude of honor. In our culture, we do not very well with honor. We don't. We make fun of everyone and everything. We disregard the elderly. We, 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 we make fun of, of people in, in high positions. Regardless of political ramifications. We don't do well with honor. But there's cultures who honor and respect is essential. I used to coach the volleyball team at, at Southwestern Academy. This is a private school in San Marino uh, near Pasadena. And that school is a, a, a boarding school. It's, an it's in an affluent town, in an affluent city, it, it, but also the students come from different parts of the, of the world. And uh, there was a time when I was coaching when we had a lot of Japanese and Korean students. So one day, we were about to play a game in the middle of the season, and, and it was important to, to win that game. So I made the, 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 the lineup for the team, and, and one of the kids who was a sophomore, a lower classmate, was going to be taking the place of somebody who was a junior. But this was the challenge. 
they were both from the same culture. When this younger boy came to me right before the game, after he was told that he was going to be starting the game, he said, Coach, I cannot start the game. And I asked him, why? Is something hurting? Are you injured? What's going on? He said, no, no. Uh, see, uh, I'm a sophomore. And he is a junior. He's my elder. And I cannot disrespect him by starting the game before him. And I said, well, it would be okay if he starts the game and after the first play you sub in? And he said, yeah, that would be fine. And he made me think. How in some cultures, honor and respect are so important. And today... I'm thinking, how in my family do I bring honor to each of the members of my family? As parents, over times, we do our part. We provide, we give them food and clothing and a, and a roof. But how do we model honor to our children? How do we talk about other people in front of our children? Are we demonstrating that honor and respect are a thing that as a family we value? Because in the way that we model to our children respect towards other people, it's, it is the way they are going to respect other people. I don't know if I told you before, but, but there was one time when this girl had met this, this young man and, uh, and she was asking questions about relationships and it got to the point that she said how would I know if he is going to be a good man I said well just look at the way he treats his mother because how we practice honor and respect towards our family members it is the way that we're going to respect other people now the Bible tells us in Romans chapter 12, verse 10, and this was, was our text for today, love one another with brotherly affection. But this is the important part, the second part. I'll do one another in showing honor. I'll do one another in showing honor. I, I don't know if it's a, 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 taken in a sense of competition that we're competing to see who shows more honor to the others. But it is a challenge to do our best, not to stay the same, but to increasingly get better as we honor other people. And that is what Paul is saying. In our society, if we are taught that I is more important than everybody else, we become a selfish society. We want to be comfortable. We want to be uh, 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 pleased regardless of what everybody else is going through. And maybe that's why we're killing the environment. But Paul is telling us something different. And Peter puts it in a different way. 1 Peter chapter 3, verse 7. Likewise, husbands, and now he's bringing it to the family. Live with your wives in an understanding way, showing honor to the woman that has the weaker vessel, since they are heirs with you of the grace of life. Now, that is important, but the most important part is next. So that your prayers may not be hindered. Now, let me explain this to you right now. You might be a Christian man, a Christian husband. You might say you're a Christian husband. You come to church, you pay tithe, you study your Sabbath school lesson, and, and you come to church. You even might come to get connected. But if you don't honor your wife, your prayers don't pass the ceiling. See, the relationship between a husband and a wife is the relationship that God is used to model his relationship with his children. He's, the Bible tells us that Jesus is, is, is the groom, is the husband, and the church 
his bride. And that is a relationship of honor. And the way that his children, the God's children, ought to live their lives is modeling that same honor. And it is interesting to, to see, to read, that when as husbands we don't give honor, we don't show honor as the head of, of, of the home, as a priest of the household, we don't teach honor in our family, we don't model it, we don't show it. We could do all the Christian things, but they mean nothing. Honor in the Old Testament had a, had a, a connotation of, of a soldier in battle. Coming back from the, ba the battle, there was a huge parade announcing victory. And, 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 the, and, the, uh, and the army that was victorious came in and the people were, were waiting on the streets, tossing flowers and, and chanting and, and, and acclaiming the victor because they had survived. And now they were in a place of honor because they achieved it. But in the New Testament, the, the phrase, the, the, the word honor, takes another connotation. It's not just a sense of victory, conquest. But honor is from a place of worship. See, I'm going to put it to you like this. Let's say that uh, you, you go to a, to, to a uh, uh, how, do they, how do they call when they sell different things? the store no um, and people bid on things okay we're on the same page auction an auction let's say that you go to an auction and somebody says we have here a Chinese boss or base how do you call them one of those pottery things and, uh, and they say, you know, this thing is valued at $200,000, which, by the way, I just checked, and one has been sold by $200,000, so that's a lot of coin for one of those things. But let's say that you go, you win the, the bid. I'm just checking to see if you're awake. You win the bid and you go home and you say, honey, guess what I just bought? And you put it in a box and you put it in your closet. Is that what you do with that? Even if you're rich, you're not going to do that. What you're going to do is that you're going to find a place when people come in the house and they see that. You're going to put it in a place of prominence, in a place where it's going to be visible, in a place where people can come to your house and you say, hey, Check this out. I just got it. $200,000. People would know one thing. That that artifact is valuable to you. And that it occupies a special place. That is what the Bible tells us about honor in the New Testament. When, he's, when he says honor one another, he's saying put each one of the members of your family in a place of value and importance. When we do that, we're practicing affection. Ephesians 6 2 says, Honor your father and mother. This is the first commandment, family. This is the first commandment with a promise. And it says, verse 3, that it may go well with you and that you may live long. And the land. That's what Ephesians says. In Exodus 20, it says that you will live long in the land that God has given you. I wonder. Uh, as a pastor, I've seen. I've, I, I've been in a lot of funerals. That's the, the sad part of the ministry. And, and funerals are sad. Some are expected. But I've never been in a happy funeral. But the saddest funerals that I've ever been to is when a parent has to bury their own child. Psych psychologists call those 
type of funeral is extemporaneous deaths. That means that it wasn't the right time because the children are supposed to bury their parents. That's the normal timing. What the Bible is telling us here is that when we don't honor our parents, our life is not going to be honorable. Our life is not going to be long. Our life is going to be sad. Not just for us, but for our parents also. So, honor is the first attitude. The second attitude is the attitude of hope. Hope. First Thessalonians 2 says, For what is our hope or, or joy or crown or boasting before our Lord Jesus at His coming? It is not you, for you are our glory and joy. Paul is talking to the people in Thessalonica. These people were in a place where Paul was not there for a very long time. In fact, he basically had contact by, by, by correspondence, was by writings. However, what Paul is telling these people in Thessalonica is that the most important thing for him is them. You. You are our joy. You are our pride. You are the most important thing. And you heard me say this before. The most important thing for God is people. People. And that is exactly what Paul is saying. You are. And that's why because of you, we want to share this hope with you. Because you are the most important thing. Romans 15, 13 says, May the God of hope fill you with all joy and peace in believing. So by the power of the Holy Spirit, you may abound in are you reading? You're not awake this morning. So that you may abound in hope. Hope. The reason why people, people succeed in the spite of adversity is because of hope. The, peop, the reason why people, and this is very interesting. I was reading an article not long ago about people who go through surgeries of different kinds. And they were asking questions about those who had survived versus those who had it. The same surgery. You, you are aware that some surgeries have more risk than others. So, so they try to ask family members of the patients what made the difference. Because medically... They had been treated the same way. What they discover is that those who go through surgeries and are successful is because they have hope. Some people they found have gone to the, to the, to the uh, surgical room already given up. But hope can only come when there is a relationship. Nobody has hope without relationships. As parents, we live for our children. You seen those movies when, when he comes to the airport and he's running through, through the stairs and goes to the second floor and goes to the gate right before she boards the plane? Why is he running all that much? They could have FaceTimed. Why is he running? Because of the relationship and the hope is to be with each other again. So hope is always the result of relationships. And relationships where affection is at the center. Now, this October, we're going to start a new stage of our life at the church. 
Ah, I see you woke up. Okay. In October, we're going to begin a series called Let God. Let God. Let God. And this series is not only for us here on Saturday morning, but we are planning to start groups at home. Some of you I know, you're already involved in groups. And some of you I know you can't live without each other anymore. And the reason why you are like that is because you've sh been sharing life with somebody else. Let me tell you something. Worship, like we do today, is great when we're sitting in rows. It's great. We look into the stage. It's awesome. But true Christian growth is better done in circles. The beauty of small groups is not the curriculum. It's not the lessons. It's not the material. All materials are good. What makes the difference is the praying for each other. The talking with each other. The sharing life together. So this October, we're going to begin to let God be part of our lives. Now, this is the challenge right now. Some of you, because, and I already know because some of you have approached me about this, concern about small groups and growing. So I know some of you are already waiting for this. We're looking to start seven groups. If we have more, hey, great. But we want to start with seven. Seven groups. If you... Begin to pray today for God's leading to see if you become, and, and listen, not a teacher, not an instructor, a host. Because that's basically what we're going to do. Uh, we're looking for hosts to open their homes so that we can pray for each other at home. Now, if you want to eat, by all means, go ahead. The Bible says that the disciples, right after uh, Jesus left, they got together in homes, they prayed for each other, they, they, they discussed the, the teachings of the disciples, and then God added to the church every day those, those who were going to be saved. So I don't know if you see it, but the key is to get together in the small groups. So, October, we'll begin with the series let God. If you're interested in becoming a host, please come approach us. Now, Caroline Light, she is going to be our coordinator of the small groups and the leaders. So if you're interested, you can come to Caroline or to myself, and, uh, and uh, we're going to give more information out as the date approaches. Now, not that you know that, we share this information because we want to become a family that grows. We want to be the place, the family, the kind of people where God brings people to be saved. And you know that God only brings people to a place where they can grow. So we want to be that place. We want to be that kind of people that shares affection and honors and have the right attitude. But let's come back to the family, our family. So what can we do? When our family has not practiced the attitude of, uh, of affection, the, the, the hope, and, and the honor. Acts 13, 34 says, For God hath promised to raise him from the dead, not leaving him to rot in the grave. Talking about Jesus. He said, I will give you the sacred blessings I promised to David. You know who David was? Besides being a king? He was a great, 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 great grandfather of Jesus. His family was not perfect by any stretch of the imagination. He was so bad at times that his son actually had a war against his father, against David. It was a bad situation. What promise is, it, is that promise of David? You know that at the end of his days, David didn't die like the other kings? He actually died 
surrounded by family. He died of old age, surrounded by family. Who of us doesn't want to have that experience? But that blessing is still reachable to us. Now, how? First action. We learn the attitudes. This is, this is how we put it into practice. The first action is communication. Communication. See, communication is very interesting. <laughs> because we all like to talk, but we don't like to listen. This is just a little snippet of communication. We're going to spend one whole morning talking about communication in more detail. But communication, we use it oftentimes just to attack each other. Like there was a couple driving. Uh, they were going in one of those cross-country drives. And as they were going through the fields, they had had an argument. They were, one was driving and the other one was way over there by the door. So they were driving, and as they're driving, they see a field, and this field is full of pigs. So the wife sees a moment to drop an attack. So she looks at the, through the window and sees the, the pigs and says, Hey, your family! So he looks at the window and says, Yeah, they're my in-laws! See, this is the thing. We use words to get to each other, and what we communicate is hurtful, and, and, and this is a crazy thing. This is a crazy thing. The people who we hurt the most is the people who are the closest. So, Proverbs 18.21 says, Death and life are in the power of our tongue. Listen carefully. Death and life are in the power of our tongue. And those who love it will eat its fruits. Let me explain that second part. We got the first one. But the second part is that whatever you do, if you kill with your words or you give life, that's what you receive. Now, there's some statistics about communication in the family. After a year of marriage, the average couple converse only 30 minutes per week. After a year of marriage. Remember those days when you were dating and you were talking on the phone? When you used to talk on the phone before texting? And you talked on the phone for hours and hours and hours and it was late already and you were saying, okay, it's time to hang up. You hang up first. No, you. <laughs> right? Because you were there talking and talking and talking and talking. Well... After one year of marriage, the conversation turns from all the time to only 30 minutes. And I know you have been victim of that statistic. Yeah. Now, and, and, he, goes, and he goes to the children too. Norris, parents speak with the children 14 minutes per day. 14 minutes per day. We're busy. We're busy. We're providing things for our children. We gave them a phone so we can talk, right? We gave them an iPad to be communi in communication, right? Harsh comments are numbered. Notice, 10 to 1, the harsh ones to the nice ones. This is a, a little poll that were, was done with teens. And this is what they discover. They asked the teens, is it difficult for you to talk to your parents? 79%, almost 80% said, yeah, it's super difficult. My parents don't listen. They don't want to talk to me. And I wonder, I saw the other day, I, I was looking for it this week, but I couldn't find it to show it to you. I saw a, 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 a picture of the family First, it's like a comic thing, and, and, and in the first part, they're driving a car, and the kids are in the back, and they're asking, are we there yet? Are we there yet? Are we there yet? And the parents are like pulling their hairs because the kids are asking questions and asking questions. And in the second part, the family is driving the same way, but the kids in the back have their headphones, 
and their devices, and they're quiet. I, I'll leave you with that one just right there. Now, the second question was, what do parents say when their children want to talk to them? The first and most popular response was, I'm busy. Not right now. I'm guilty. The second most popular response was, not now. And the third, be quiet. You see what happens? We have lost the ability to communicate because we don't teach our children to communicate. Most of our communication as parents to our, children's, to our children is this. Do this, do that. Don't do that. How much? At what time are you coming back? That's the extent of our communication. I don't know if I told you the story about the, the, the family who came to me one day when I was a young youth pastor, and, and they came to me, and, and the father got me in the hallway and said, Pastor, you know, if my child gets lost, if my son gets lost, it's going to be your fault. I was young and inexperienced, so at first I believe him. But then I say, wait, uh, you know, brother, this is the situation. You bring your son to come to Sabbath school with the youth when he comes early and he's with us for an hour and a half. If he's paying attention through the sermon, well, it's going to be another hour. So that's two and a half hours. If you bring him to the program in the afternoon, that's going to be another hour. That's three and a half hours. That's three and a half hours that he is with me. How many hours a week is he with you? And I think that's where the problem is. We coined this phrase back in the 80s, and you remember, remember it well, quality time. But let me tell you what. Any time is quality time if you are with your children. You could be being silly. You could be doing something spiritual, something fun, something recreational. It doesn't matter. Spend time with your children. That is quality time when you are with your children. So communication is the first action that we ought to practice. The second thing that we have, the second action that we ought to practice is control. Control. James 1.20 says, for the anger of man does not produce the righteousness of God. Now, righteousness is defined as the ability to do what is right. It's not a synonym of perfection. It's to do what is right at the moment that decisions are made. Now, why are we talking about control? Proverbs 14, 29, whoever is slow to anger has great understanding, but he who has hasty temper exalts folly. In other words, he who gets angry easily, it's going to make a dumb decision. Now, let's bring it home. Our children make mistakes. Do you have children that never made mistakes? As parents, our duty is to discipline, is to correct our children, right? We err in these two ways as parents. We punish for errors, for mistakes, but we condone attitude and character. When we do that, we're committing the greatest disservice to our children. See, when you're at the table, you're having dinner, or you're at a restaurant, and one of the kids knocks over the glass of water, what do you do? Why did you do that? 
What in the world? What are you thinking? But they could be disrespectful or dishonoring. Oh, it'll pass. Are you with me? Now, I haven't been to your homes yet, at least not all of you. So I haven't seen that yet. But that's what we do. We are like that as human beings. Now, my suggestion to you, I had to learn this the hard way. One of my many flaws is that I get angry easily. So don't get on my wrong side. And because I tend to do that, now you're going to be like, Pastor? <laughs> I learn that mistakes are things that can be corrected. Mistakes happen for two reasons. Lack of training. Or not knowing how to do it right. When somebody, when one of the kids knocks over the water or the milk, well, he needs to learn to put it in front of the plate, not next to his arm. Easily correctable. So, lack of training. Mistakes are corrected. But when it's an issue of attitude, that habit turns into his or her character. And the one thing we're going to take to heaven is our character. Our character modeled by Jesus. So those things that have to do with attitude and character are the things that we got to focus on. Usually, Issues of character are reflected in two ways. Lies or disrespect. And that is what needs to be corrected. Oftentimes, the kid does something wrong. And, and by the way, I'm not perfect, a perfect parent by all means of the imagination. And you can witness that by looking at my children. So... When they make a mistake, and they're like, Dad. When, when, when they, the kids make a mistake, the wrong question to ask is, why did you do that? That's the dumbest question we could ask as a parent. Because the kid will tell you, well, a million reasons why they did it. The question that we ought to ask, especially when they're younger, is, what, what you did, what, what you just did, is it right or wrong? Because our duty is to teach them character. What you did is the right or wrong. But now they're going to have to think. And when we teach them to think between right and wrong, we're teaching values. We're teaching character. And the next question is, if you do it again, what should your punishment be? Now, this gets really interesting. Kids are cruel. What should your punishment be next time you do this? And, and they come with crazy ideas like two months without breathing, you know, kind of thing. And, and three weeks without water, you know. No, 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 no. You're just not going to do that again. Because if you do it, then you're going to lose privileges. Are you with me? Now, I was born in a time where parents used weapons. <laughs> and not only parents, teachers. You remember those days? I think we turned out all right, didn't we? <laughs> right? <laughs> well, but see, the Bible says... That the father who loves his child uses the rod. It's my favorite text. I have it big on the refrigerator. No. 
No, but that's what the Bible says. That's what the Bible says. But you know, we live in a culture where that is not legal anymore. However, I believe that God knew what He was doing and He put cushion in a place <laughs> to administer discipline. But that only works and to a certain age. I made many mistakes. And I've learned that there are things that hurt a lot more when they get older. Our primary responsibility as parents is to guide our children to mold their characters. Because mistakes happen at all times in life. But character is our primary responsibility. Luke 13, 29 says, And people will come from east and west and from north and south and recline at the... T oh, I skipped the text. I'm sorry. I'm sorry. The, the next thing, the next thing that we, that we got uh, to do, the next action, we, we talked about um, communication. We talked about control. And the third one is celebration. I kind of like this one. Notice. Genesis 21 8 says, And the child grew and was weaned, and Abraham made a great feast on the day that Isaac was weaned. Now, let me ask a question. What accomplishment did Isaac just complete it? Did he graduate? Did he win a battle? Did he win a medal? No, he just now he's going to eat solids. Yay! But Abraham throws a party. Why? Because Abraham is celebrating every stage of the life of his son. We don't celebrate winning anymore. At least it's not part of our culture. But we celebrate in other ways that oftentimes we forget. You know... In my office, I still have drawings that Janny did. One day, he took paper from the printer and he drew on the sheets of paper. And he said, Dad, look. Nice. What is it? Well, I have a column of those things. We have things on the refrigerator. We have a bulletin board in the house. Now we don't have places to put things anymore. But now they draw a little better. But you see, we try to be there for all their accomplishments. We try to be there to celebrate with them. At the end of the day, that's what is going to be remembered. The spankings, they won't remember. Well, maybe they will. They won't remember the times when they were corrected, but they will remember the results of their correction. And that is a motive for celebration. That is the reason why we have to celebrate. And Luke 13, 29 says, now we're going there. And people will come from east and west and from north and south and recline at the table in the kingdom of God. Why? Because our God is a God of celebration. Think about this for a second. Think about this. The first miracle that Jesus performed was at a celebration. The last thing that Jesus did before the cross with his disciples was at a celebration. You know what is the first thing we're going to do when we get to heaven? It's going to be a celebration. The feast of the Lamb. And another version of the Bible says, the wedding of the Lamb. We're going to celebrate our God is a God of celebration. So if our God is a God of celebration, is the least thing that we should do in our families. Celebrate. You know, I was talking to somebody the other day, and he was so proud because he had been 15 years, he had not gone on a vacation. 
Not because he couldn't, not because he didn't have the time or the money. It's just because he was proud that he never went on a vacation. I guarantee you he has the most bored children in the world. God made us. He installed in our brain, in our bodies, the gene to celebrate. To celebrate. But celebration can only come when there is a hope. Celebration can only come when there is honor. And when we, heart, when we practice, when we plant, when we act in communication, when we act in control, when we act in celebration, God is in the middle of the family. And just like me, I know you've made mistakes in the past. Some mistakes we regret. But you know what? It's never too late to celebrate. It's never too late. I've seen the greatest moments of reconciliation in families gathering at a table. So maybe, just maybe, what we need today is to celebrate a little more. And let God be at the center of our table. Let us pray. Father in heaven, today we pray for our children. We pray for our young people. We, we pray for mothers and, and fathers and, and grandparents. Our families have been left alone perhaps because of the routine of the, of the day, the busyness, the schedule, the distance. And we've forgotten what is truly important. Help us to, to take the advice of the Apostle Paul and to outdo one another in honoring each other. Help us to practice a like we've never done it before and help us to make our home a piece of heaven on earth in Jesus name we pray amen